Governor? Good afternoon, and uh, my name is Joel Bloom. I have the pleasure of serving as the president of this fine university. And uh, this is an uh, opportunity to just briefly tell you you are in the NGIT Makerspace. Uh, Makerspace is the concept and implementation of our dean of engineering, Moshe Kam. Moshe, thank you. Um, and the purpose of the makerspace is to prepare young men and women to work in advanced manufacturing. At the end of the day, all science and technology is about producing something. And to produce that something, whether it's through these 3D printers or metal cutters, is advanced manufacturing. So NGIT, with funding $10 million from the state, built this first 10 thousand square foot, and sorry for the construction, but we're adding on to this, the second 10,000 square feet. It's about the jobs of the future. So we're growing the university, we're closing in on 12,000 students, doing $170 million in research, and we added a million square feet to this is the state's public polytechnic university. Along with our research mission, our education mission, is a mission about economic development. This is an example of economic development. Another example of economic development is one-third of the engineers of the STEM employees in the state of New Jersey came out of this institution. So we create the workforce, and that workforce has a multiplier effect. Some people say as many as seven additional jobs are added every time you hire or produce a STEM employee. We added something else in 2014, and that's NJII, the New Jersey Innovation Institute. It's doing $120 million in contract work. It is the portal, not unlike this, to work with business and industry, to respond to the needs of business and industry. For example, we are leading for the entire state of New Jersey, the New Jersey Healthcare Information Network. 97% of the hospitals, 3,000 uh, folks are on this network. This network has saved millions of dollars by not duplicating the healthcare record every time you walk in to an emergency room or, thank you, or every time you see a different doctor, it's one medical record. Another piece that we're working on through the New Jersey Innovation Institute under construction beyond that facility, there is a new facility up at um, RBHS, Rutgers Biomedical Health facility, building up the university campus to the, right behind us. And on this campus, we are partnering with uh, the bio and the farmer industry to create new labs for cell and gene therapy production. They'll be doing cell production on this campus and on the Rutgers campus the, uh, the, the gene therapy. So again, the partnerships, the partnership with industry, other universities. Last piece about our economic development, Simon Nines is here. Simon is heading up something. We started in 1989, we started incubating businesses. At one time, we were up to 90. But it was the old-fashioned type of business incubation. Today, we've reduced the numbers. It's also, again, largest science technology incubator in the state of New Jersey, 62 companies. We just brought in a new company called Oculomoda. Oculomoda is led by a faculty member here, two of our honest college students who graduated several years ago. They have now created a therapy uh, in order to prevent eye disease, and that's a therapy that uh, focuses on virtual reality and gaming. So this university is all about the economic development, creating the workforce, and it's all about STEM. And that gives me the pleasure of talking about, we now have a STEM governor. We have a governor that is focused on innovation, entrepreneurship, creating jobs, and again, to quote from his master plan, jobs for all across the continuum 
for economic development in the state of New Jersey. New Jersey, as we know, is one of the most densely populated states for STEM, manufacturing, STEM jobs, STEM development. So we need the workforce, we need facilities like this, we need the kind of funding which is being increased for higher ed in the first time. So it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce somebody who you know well, our 56th governor of the state of New Jersey, and, and a honorary PhD from NGIT, so Dr. <laughs> governor, honorary. <laughs> I was going to let that slip as well, Joel, that I'm, I'm, I'm an alum uh, by virtue of giving a speech a few weeks ago to an extraordinary graduating class. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the New Jersey Innovation Institute, to the makerspace here at NGIT, where the expertise and institutional support of NGIT is paired with private capital and innovative startups across a range, as you just heard from Joel, a range of industries. So Joel, to you and Simon and the entire NJIT team, thank you so much for hosting us today and uh, so graciously. And Joel, this isn't maybe even in the first hand of time of fingers that you've hosted me. So right way, way back when, when we started a think tank um, in New Start, New Jersey, way back to try to figure out solutions to our economic challenges, Joel hosted our kickoff, and from that moment on, he and his team have been great supporters. So it's always a pleasure to be with you, Joel, and your team. Also with us today, we've got sort of in addition to Joel and Simon, we've got a murderer's row here, uh, and you'll hear from several of them in a few minutes. We've got the Economic Development Authority Chief Executive Tim Sullivan is in the house. Uh, we've got Aisha Glover, President and CEO of Newark Alliance, is with us. Tom Wisniewski of Newark Venture uh, Partners. Propelify founder and old friend CEO Aaron Price is with us. Uh, Invest in Literacy CEO and other friend Saki Dodelson, all the way in from uh, Tel Aviv via Ocean County. Saki, it's always an honor to have you with us. Um, and we've got some uh, legislative leaders. We've got Assemblyman Ralph Caputo, Assemblywoman Myla JC, uh, and we've got the one and only, and you'll hear from him in a little bit, Governor Dick Cody. Thank you all for being here. We have Councilman. Uh, John Sharp James um, in the house, uh, BA for Newark, Business Administrator Eric Pennington, and Union County Freeholder, former mayor and part of the NGIT family, Angela Gerritsen. So this is, a, this is a murderer's row, as I said, of folks up here and in the audience and many other friends. So great to have you all here. If there is a space that exemplifies our vision to reform New Jersey's economic incentives, look around here. This is it. And if there is a space that exemplifies at the same time what has been left out of our current incentive programs and who has been overlooked in favor of the wealthy and well-connected, keep looking around. This is also it. Our current system of incentives, as I noted the other day, was designed by a few to benefit the few. Its flaws have been made abundantly clear. Its awards are grossly out of line with what our competitor states provide, and those states had been eating our lunch in economic development terms before we got here. The current system is unfocused and does not properly target either high growth industries or promising locations. It robs us of our ability to invest in our people. It has left communities behind, and I repeat again the fact that while this system was running unchecked, we remained near the very bottom of the list nationally in terms of wage growth, job growth, poverty eradication, among other economic factors. In each of those three, we were 42, 49, and 47 in the country. And that's out of 50, by the way. The legislature, just for math majors paying attention, the legislature sent me a short-sighted bill to extend these programs as is as if these shortcomings can somehow be ignored. To the surprise of absolutely no one, I will veto this bill, period. So this, yeah, so this begs, this begs the question, very simple question, whose side are you on? 
I'm on the side of the taxpayers, communities, and entrepreneurs. I'm not on the side of a broken and rigged system designed by special interests for special interests. Our current system is indefensible, and I believe the members of the legislature know this. And I know the folks who I already shouted out know this because they voted against it. Governor Cody, Assemblywoman J.C., Assemblyman Caputo, and Assemblywoman Cleopatra Tucker, who just joined us. We're all on the right side of history. Now, this is not a new, uh, new ask on our side. I first called for us to work on the next generation of incentives a scant 16 months ago. 16 months that the legislature let slip by. The program I put forward nine months ago is fiscally responsible, it's transparent, and it's strategic. It shows the potential of creating a true startup culture and reclaiming our foothold as a global leader in the innovation economy. It has a vision for deploying taxpayer resources to build a vibrant economic future. It holds the businesses here at the NJII and incubators across our state in the same regard as it does that next big global headquarters would like to draw to our state. This is not either or, this is and both, and that's the way it should be. It allows for fully transformational projects to take shape. It leverages venture capital to invest in more startups and to reclaim the more than billions of dollars in VC investments that left New Jersey over the past decade. It rewards businesses which honor labor and who, who pursue things the right way and the honest way. It is everything that the current program, the program again that the legislature voted to continue, is not. The legislature, by the way, can take up this new program that we are proposed immediately. This is not that hard. The businesses taking shape here are worth that. They are the ones that will transform our economy, make it stronger and more resilient. And when they graduate from here, will go on to create good paying jobs and continue the transformation in our cities. New Jersey's economic future relies on becoming the home of the world's leading technology, clean energy, advanced manufacturing, logistics, and life sciences companies. It relies on tackling complex problems with multifaceted solutions. All of this is easily within our reach. We have everything we need right here to dominate this landscape, from our location to our diverse and talented workforce to our leading institutions of higher education like NJIT. And while we want an incentives program that will attract businesses to come and expand here, we certainly want that, even more though, we need to make New Jersey the place where these companies are born in the first place. At some point, amen, at some point in all of our lives, we look in the mirror and we each have invariably been asked, where do you see yourself in 10 years? In 10 years, we want New Jersey to be flush with innovative new businesses and new good paying jobs, all of that that works for the many and not the few. And we want New Jersey to be able to back them up with sustained public investments in education, infrastructure, workforce housing, and a progressive value system that is second to none in the United States or anywhere in the world. So it, with that, it is now my pleasure to invite up the Chief Executive Officer of the Economic Development Authority, Tim Sullivan, to make a few comments. Tim, come on down. Thank you, Governor. It's an honor to be here. President Bloom, thank you so much for having us. Governor Cody, it's an honor to be here with you and members of the legislature and local leadership. Great to be here with you, all of you. I, I just want to add on and, and build on something that the Governor talked about um, with regard to sort of where we stand as we, as we look forward uh, to a, new, a next generation of economic development incentives. One of the biggest drivers of some of the very troubling data that the Governor cited being 42nd in job creation, 47th in the rate of change of our poverty moving in the wrong direction, 49th uh, from a wage uh, perspective, 49th worst in the country, is because of a significant drop-off in our innovation economy and specifically new companies forming and become, going from being very small to small to mid-sized to large companies. As recently as 2007, New Jersey was fifth for the amount of venture capital that was invested in the companies taking root here. By 2017, that had fallen to 15th. And once you start falling that fast and out of that top five or ten group, 
you're with a group, you know, you, you're, we're not where we need to be. And that has choked off a source of investment for the young companies that turn into big, successful companies that are hatched in places like the makerspace that we're in today and that take root and, and, and are blossoming in the 21st century economy. And so we need an incentives package and an, an incentive toolkit that is more powerful, more robust, and more targeted to those specific areas of growth that we really need to focus on. Um, and the, the governor's proposal for, an for the Innovation Evergreen Fund uh, does exactly that. It, it, it's a very specific tool, and I think it's an innovative tool in its own right that would partner, uh, create partnerships between large companies that are successful and growing and hiring lots of people, and we celebrate those companies, and the small startups that hope to be the, um, the, the, the large companies of the future. Because all around the country, if you look at the most successful innovation ecosystems, you see some very specific partnerships and purposeful uh, work to, working together between the big companies, the startups, and the academic institutions like the one we're in today to create that kind of innovation ecosystem and the kind of uh, uh, dynamism and vibrancy in your innovation ecosystem that creates tens of thousands of jobs uh, in new, good-paying fields. By itself, that is, that is a, a, a sea change in how we think about economic development, to really focus on young, growing companies. And by itself, uh, it, it would only go a part of the way, which is why the governor's proposal to make it significant investments in uh, communities, particularly in things like historic preservation and redevelopment, in brownfield redevelopment, and in creating transformative, transit-oriented development projects to, cr to create vibrancy and dynamism in the communities where the 21st century economy wants to take root. Communities, of course, just like Newark and Camden and Patterson and Jersey City and Trenton. Those are the places where we need to make those kinds of targeted investments to have a truly comprehensive uh, approach to economic development. That's what the governor's proposal uh, that he referenced that was made nine months ago lays out and what we're eager to see uh, brought to life uh, under his leadership. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Good job, man. Tim made a couple of points I want to just underscore. When you're not in the top five in venture capital and you slip to 15, you might as well slip to 45. There's only a handful of places in this country which dominate that scene. We have to be one of them. We were, we have to again. So it's Boston, it's New York City, it's Northern California, and it better darn well be New Jersey again. Secondly, it's not either or between, I mentioned this as well in my remarks, between big companies and startups. It's and both. In fact, not only is it and both, but they each benefit from being as closely cohabitated and engaged with each other as humanly possible. Uh, which is why the particular Evergreen Investment Fund ha has that element associated with it. It isn't just money. It isn't just venture capital money. It's bonding the big companies with the startup community. With that, uh, in so many respects, as Newark, Camden, Trenton, uh, Patterson, its own way, Atlantic City go, I say this all the time with Newark at the head of the class, as it goes, so goes the great state of New Jersey. So it's honored to be here in Newark, and I'd love to call up the president and CEO of the Newark Alliance and a great partner and friend for us, Aisha Glover. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. Um, it's an honor to be here today uh, and bring remarks and support from our city and on behalf of Mayor Raj J. Baraka, uh, uh, Business Administrator Eric Pennington was mentioned earlier, Councilman James, all the legislator, legislatures on the state side um, supporting this legislation. I want to thank you. Thank you to the governor for making it clear the direction you want our state and our cities to head in. And so we're all very clear. These incentives are about growth and investment. Investment to communities that will spark development. The flip side of that is that during this time in limbos, our cities, small businesses, and our residents are being affected. I, for example, have a large global firm right now that it's looking to consolidate and relocate. I have a Connecticut-based company looking to open a second 200,000 square foot facility. We need to have certainty and we need it to be equitable. Aspire and Forward clearly outline community benefits or community engagement bonuses, prioritizing uh, local hiring, food deserts, bonuses for local purchasing. Forward is constructed to incent businesses to move into opportunity zones, of which Newark has 13 tracks, three of which cover downtown and the 10 remaining are in the neighborhoods. Historic preservation tax credits, yes, thank you. <laughs> 
Historic preservation tax credits and brownfield incentives are also key, so we're not just thinking about mega projects, but the small abandoned gas station in a neighborhood. Newark is also a burgeoning tech and innovation hub, and the way that we harness that needs to be deliberately focused on an innovation agenda that takes advantage of our tech anchors like Audible to startup incubators, accelerators, co-working spaces like Newark Venture Partners and Equal Space. Investing in individual businesses and these hotbeds for innovation is key. I usually throw out this stat or say this in some sector, excuse me, in some uh, speech or panel or remark because I don't know that everybody recognizes the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurship in the country are black women. The second fastest, <laughs> the second fastest are Latina women. Yet, Yet we get access to less than 1% of venture capital funds. Tools like Evergreen are an important part of the equity pie. We need to be investing more intentionally in founders of color and their employees. Investment portfolios should represent founders who look like New Jersey and look like Newark. Thank you. Aisha, thank you for that, and thanks for everything you do. We, we, we don't have a closer relationship, I think it's fair to say, in our administration with any community in this state than the one we have with Newark, and Aisha's right in the middle of that. Uh, we're eight minutes, minutes into stoppage time. The U.S. is up two to one on Spain, and the women's uh, round is 16. So keep, keep them in your prayers. Uh, are, I, don't, I, I don't know that there are any Spain supporters in the room. I do know there's a good... Okay, I'm just checking. Um, I mentioned uh, Saki Dodelson earlier that we had met actually at Aaron Price's, and we'll hear from Aaron in a few minutes, at his Propellify uh, annual gig in Hoboken, which is a pretty cool gig. Uh, Saki uh, hails from Tel Aviv, um, you know, the, the startup nation and the state of innovation. Israel on the one hand and New Jersey on the other, I think, have a particular special bond uh, we visited uh, on an official visit last fall. I'm actually headed back to Israel for a shorter visit later this summer. Uh, but Saki is the CEO of Invest in Literacy and would love to ask her to come up and say a few words. Saki? Thank Hi. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor. My accent is from Tel Aviv, so I apologize. Nineteen years ago, I had a dream, a dream that all kids can have the skills they need to be successful in life, regardless of their social economics, regardless of their color, religion, and we said, with technology, what's so hard? The school can be in the future. I'm impulsive. I decided to do it and started a company. Nineteen years later, we helped millions of kids to read and write better. We gave jobs to hundreds of people, mostly women, because we are better and made a lot of money. In 2015, I sold the company for 300 million. So what can be better? Mission, margin, life is awesome. Let me take you back to 2000, 2001, 2002. A female with an accent wants to start a company that based on technology, cloud-based, in education, when nobody understands what, go to school and say cloud-based. In 2000, they ordered 911 to take me away and tried to raise money. I tried, and it was so hard. People ask me, how do I know you're not gonna go shopping with the money? I mean, I'll tell you, I can write a book. At one point, after two years, I paid payroll on 43 different credit cards. I have a, over $1.3 million on different credit cards. And without, you know, angels and organization like New Jersey Tech Council, that I don't know why, but they were different. They decided to believe in me and actually take the risk and invest. Besides, you know, there were some awesome people like, you know, John Martinson from Edison Venture, Greg Olsen, they decided, you know what? We'll help you. We'll connect you with people. We'll find your rent, you know, for cheaper. You need connection. The only thing you have is time. And they provided it for us, and, you know, they actually made money, met a lot of money, and we helped so many kids. So I can tell you, life is so hard when you try to create a company, focus on customer, focus on your employees, 
and you also have to raise money. I mean, that's just, you know, it's too hard. So I can't thank enough from the Jersey Tech Council for the people that helped me. But there were some hardships. You know, at the time, NJEDA, you know, we tried to close a deal, and in the last moment I was told, you have to give your house as a collateral. I'm not stupid, I could just get a mortgage. So we need infrastructures. We need to be able to help people, people that have ideas, and take a risk, especially if we have social impact. How can we do it without it? In May, I started a new company with the same dream, to begin to help all kids, regardless where they are, from the time they leave the hospital, you know, the school is in the future. There's no reason why we discriminate kids according to what school they go to or what house they're born in. That we want to make sure we have ACT for all, SAT for all, and access to all kids. I decided to stay in New Jersey because I know now we're going to have the infrastructure. We're going to have offices so we get the cheap rent, the connection, and I hope to get the right investment. So thank you for listening, and I just can't tell you how much it's needed. Thank you. Really well done, Saki. It's great to be with you again. Um, I met Don Katz uh, many, many years ago, and, and the, new, the notion of the Newark Venture Partners was sort of a gleam in not just his eye, but it was an early stage notion, and it has taken root uh, with great success uh, in Newark uh, with, with its tentacles uh, very visibly impacting the economy and the society in this great community. Uh, with that, we'd love to bring up one of its managing partner uh, of Newark Venture Partners, Tom Wisniewski. Tom? Uh, so, hello, my name is Tom Wisniewski. I'm one of the two managing directors and also a founder of Newark Venture Partners. Um, I do get asked a fair amount about um, uh, the Evergreen Fund and the governor's efforts to do these things and whether I think it's a good idea or not because I am a venture capitalist, I'm in this business. And um, it's not hard for me to be a very enthusiastic supporter of this. Um, I would, without perhaps the danger of being a little ill-modest, I would say Newark Venture Partners is in fact an example an early example of what can be done in a public-private partnership and one that could be energized even more by a program like this. So Newark Venture Partners was formed four years ago. We are a venture capital fund for profit, but we have a second bottom line. And our second bottom line is drive economic impact in Newark. We are based here in Newark, right? We look to move the economics of here. We look to create jobs, we look to create taxes. So it's in our DNA that we know that there's this impact. Um, we, we've brought hundreds of people to, uh, thousands of people to Newark who had never been here before. We've invested in um, companies that have hundreds of employees. We have uh, invested in about 64 companies to date. More than half of them maintained a presence here. About 20 of them, their headquarters is here. Right? It's that kind of impact that I think venture capital can have. And beyond just those tech jobs, which are really, really powerful and are well-paying, and I think those STEM jobs that we all crave, there's a, there's a great economic theory which says for every tech job, that especially you have in an urban environment, you get three to five additional jobs, right? Because it supports an ecosystem, it supports a community. And it's, it's that what we're trying to tap into and we can feel it happening. Um, as I think about, um, what made it possible for us to do what we've done here. Uh, it involved a number of, of large corporations, as um, the governor said, are a key part of this. Audible Amazon, I see some of the people here from, from Audible. Uh, RWJ Barnabas, Panasonic, uh, Dun & Bradstreet, uh, TD Bank. Um, they all felt, one, that this was a good idea for them to get involved in venture capital because they knew they wanted to get closer to innovation. It's important to large companies to have innovation next door, because they struggle to be innovative. They want this to be here, right? They see it as a, a way to get their employees involved. They see it as a way to see new ideas. And from a startup's perspective, it's also equally important. These are the companies they want to sell to. These are the companies they would dream to work for. So we have that involved here. In addition, we have close partnerships with Rutgers and with NGIT, because again, it's that partnership between those entities that makes venture capital and this process much easier and also more, I think, fulfilling for all of the people in our interest are just very well aligned. Um, we also are, are proud to say that we have money from uh, New Jersey EDA in the fund, and we look to EDA as a great partner and would love to continue to um, 
uh, uh, work with them through the, the Evergreen Fund and, and work with them to try and create even more incentives. Um, we're lucky here in New Jersey. As much as we want to tout our horn and, and toot our horn and talk about the great companies we have here, we're right next to New York. In New York, 200 new venture capital funds were created in the last couple of years. We want to tap into that. We're in a golden age of venture capital and the creation of technology companies. We have the power through incentives like this to bring that, to bring that forward. Last thing I'll say is I'd, I'd like to uh, look out and uh, uh, recognize a couple of our entrepreneurs that are here. And I would say they're here in Newark and here in New Jersey probably specifically because of a program like this, of a, of a venture capital fund focused on this. I see uh, Craig Lamoni, um, who has a med tech company. He's working very closely with RWJ Barnabas and has benefited from that. I uh, think I see Steve back there uh, from Mochify, uh, which is a financial services company focused on providing um, financial services and uh, products to the underbanked to the black and brown communities which don't have access to all these things. And I, I think without a fund here, they probably would have thought of something else, would have gone to New York. So that's the power that I see in this, in this ability to pull together among resources around us for a common theme, right? And engender, bring great smart people like these two uh, to a place like Newark. Thank you. Tom, thank you for that, and thank you for everything you're doing to transform the venture reality in this state. Thanks to the one and only Megan Rapino. two goals, the U.S. beat Spain two to one. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's the good news. The bad news is we play the quarterfinals, I think, in Paris on Friday against France. Um, I mentioned Aaron Price earlier. Aaron and I uh, bonded way back when, when it was cold, dark, and lonely for me. He was sponsoring some tech meetups in Hoboken, and as I mentioned, he is the, 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 the guy behind the Propellify, his own company, but also the Propell Propellify annual gathering, which is a crazy cool mix of, uh, of folks in the tech and STEM space more broadly. He is the founder and CEO of Propellify. Please help me welcome Aaron Price. I think I'm also going to take credit, if I could, unknowingly, for inspiring the governor's cool shoes. Because I, I also wear sneakers to events. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Like yeah, it. yeah. I love Honestly that. done. 95 bucks free ship. <laughs> <laughs> All birds number one advocate. Um, hello. We got it. We got up our game here. Hello. Hello. There we go. My name is Aaron Price, and I'm the founder of Propellify. I uh, represent one of the largest communities of entrepreneurs, not just in New Jersey, but really around the globe. And I've been a startup founder myself really since my teenage years, unfortunately a while ago, and recognized the power of bringing together community and how we could help one another build our companies. And so I started Propellify to do just that, not just for New Jersey, but for anyone around the world. And so we welcome over 8,000 attendees to an event that we host on PRA in Hoboken for, for uh, talks. We've had the governor. We appreciate his support for exhibitors, for startup booths, for technology expositions, for VR, investor speed dating, interviews on a Ferris wheel, all things around the startup ecosystem. They're very cool, and you can come next year. All things around, not that you need a new job, all things around the startup economy that represent the culture of startups. And too often I see my startup founder friends leave the state, cross the river to build their businesses. And it's, it's frustrating. And I think we could do so much more to keep them here in New Jersey. That's why I'm a huge supporter of the Evergreen Fund. If you're a venture capitalist in New Jersey, it is a no-brainer. If you're unaware, this is follow-on capital led by the professionals to add more money into startups where they make the same amount of money that they would from their own limited partner investment. If you're an entrepreneur, this forces you to give New Jersey a second look. Raising capital is painful, it takes a lot of time, and it takes away time from building your business. With the Evergreen Fund, we give New Jersey an unfair advantage to those entrepreneurs. They can look to New Jersey to say, now when I raise capital from these venture capitalists in New Jersey, I can significantly add to my investment. I look to places where we can have an unfair advantage. It's why we host our event on a pier in Hoboken. New York, it turns out, has no view of New York. Hoboken has a fantastic unfair advantage in that regard. With the Evergreen Fund, we can do the same thing and give an unfair advantage to startups looking to raise capital in New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you.
One takeaway for me sounds like we need to buy New York a mirror. Uh, we've been joined uh, by, I mentioned that uh, our incentive program that we have put forward rewards labor, organized labor, uh, and does right by labor. And we've been joined by not only a great legislator, but a, as vocal and as clarion a, a speaker on behalf of organized labor as anyone I know, Assemblyman Tom Giblin. So great to have you. So I'm not sure there was a vote, but if there was, it was unanimous. But the Assembly members, Caputo, uh, Tucker, JC, and Giblin, uh, have uh, ceded the floor to one of my heroes, a guy I've known about as long as I've known anybody in this state, certainly in the political scene, uh, but somebody when he was in this seat stood for the right things and did the right things. Please help me welcome Governor Dick Cody. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see my colleagues here, Assemblyman Caputo, Cleo Tucker, my running mate, uh, Ms. Jesse, and uh, Tom Giblin, as the governor mentioned, and Freeholder Stewart. Eric, you get the toughest job in Newark, right? <laughs> Did I miss anybody? No. So the doctor was telling me about all the new things that are going on here, and he says, Governor, you, know, you can come down and get a new hip. And it's I said, my bones are fine, Doc. I don't need it right now. But uh, I'll take a doctorate like you gave to Murphy, for God's sakes, which reminds me of a story. So I'm governor, and they asked me to speak at Princeton. So I went down, and I got up, and I said, well, you know, I was almost a student here, but I was 300 points short on the SAT. And I paused, and I said, and that was just on the math side. I don't think Murph ever had that problem. Um, so listen, we are at, at a time in our state where everything seems to be going wrong and everything some people knew that was going on is finally coming out. And you know, Mr. Sullivan, the E in EDA should be changed to everyone because the program before you came was not for everyone. It was for the special few. And that's wrong. It should be for all of us, all of us, all of us. And this committee, it kind of like a Trump investigating Mueller at the same time. I mean, I, I don't get it, uh, but it needs to be straightened out. We need to pull back, find out what was going on, who was involved, and I'd love to find out the person from the EDA who felt physically intimidated, and who was the creep that was doing that? Because that's just outrageous. But on this issue, we need to get behind the governor, all of us. There should be the legislators here in the county backing him, saying, hold, hold, hold on. Let's see what really went on down there, and then when we find out, then we'll move forward because the nature of the program is a good idea, but the last eight years, it was not for all of us, but only for a few of them. And by the way, the idea that the owner of the 70, uh, 76ers, he got the building for a practice facility. So the jobs, the few jobs, very few jobs that came over, there was no new jobs created. And we, the taxpayers, paid for a helipad for him. Then we paid for a helipad for the Democrat, well, whatever you want to call him, okay? I mean, that's not everyone. So, to all of you, let's get it on, move forward, and hopefully the governor and the leaders in the Senate and the Assembly can get together on a budget, be fair and open, and move this state forward. Thank you. I've noticed that after everyone has spoken, they keep walking out stage left here. Thank you to each of our speakers and to the August group that's been with us today. Take a couple questions from the press. From the press we get first. Thank you. On the latter question, it hasn't been a part of budget negotiations. No, I think we have to prove that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We're one of the largest American states. 
The job I've got is very complex. The job the legislators have, I need not tell them, is very complex. We have to be able to prove that we can, uh, we can travel along multiple uh, uh, tracks at the same time, walk and chew gum, if you will, at the same time. Uh, the, one second. I, please. I apologize. I didn't mention. He's pulling rank, by the way. I know that. I want to congratulate him come, come in here. for having the onions to do what he's doing to stand up, because I know what happens when you stand up to him, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess the simplest answer on your first question as to why we haven't vetoed it yet is this is still, there's an opportunity between now and June 30th to get this right. I mentioned this in my remarks and I'm not being flippant. Um, we've been very clear. It's a very straightforward uh, proposal. The, the bill that we envision has five elements to it. It's a renewed corporate piece. It's a renewed community piece. It's the Evergreen Investment Fund for venture capital. It's Brownfields, a better Brownfields uh, element. And lastly, uh, as was mentioned by Tim, the historical uh, preservation tax credit, uh, all of which are game changers, very straightforward, transparent, capped, forward-leaning. I still hope, you know, perhaps naively, still hope between now and June 30th we can find some common ground. Please. One hundred percent. Why should they come here? For a lot of reasons. They should come here for the number two public school system in America, number one in physics, number two in chemistry, number one in foreign language participation. Save the Children ranks New Jersey the number one state in America to raise a kid. We have the ranked best hospital systems in the United States of America. We have the best location of any state in America. We have the most diverse population of any state in America. We're fixing NJ Transit. If it kills me, we'll fix it. It might, by the way. Um, the list for why someone should come here, uh, work here, raise a family here is a long one. Now that doesn't mean that I'm happy with the property tax mess that I inherited, which I did inherit, like a lot of other things, and we're working doggedly day and night to crack the back of that property tax reality. Last year was the lowest increase in property taxes in this state on average in its history, but it was still an increase. I'm committed to cracking the back of that and decreasing it over time. So the lists, the, the reasons to, to come here, live here, bring your family up, do business here are long, and we want to make sure we grow that list. And high on that list are institutions of higher education, including NJIT. We have among the best institutions of higher education in the United States of America. Our challenge, by the way, is to make them affordable. So I bemoan the fact while the, the, the budget I got back from the legislature, I want to make sure everyone understands this because there's a lot of noise out there, we got overwhelmingly the priorities that we wanted to get funded, and we're really happy about that. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. Education, transportation, health care, property tax relief, um, opioid programs to break the back of this awful scourge. We didn't get everything, and one of the things we didn't get enough of was the Community College Opportunity Grant, which I know doesn't help you, Joel, although TAG and EOF does help you, but c community colleges are a game changer. I'd love to see more money in that. Daniel. I'll let them speak for themselves, but there, I heard from one of my colleagues today that there is movement afoot to have explicit bills sponsored in the very near term. Brenda. Sorry, sir, are you, are you in the press or not? Oh, you are? Okay. Brenda, then I'll come back to you. That's okay. To be determined. I mean, as I said to you on, when we were together, Brenda, was that Friday? feels like a, a year ago. Um, uh, all options are on the table. Lots of discussions back and forth. Um, again, I'm thankful for the very high 90-something percent of what we wanted to get funded that we got back from the legislature. There are some things we'd like to see more of. I mentioned community colleges. The tax fairness piece, the whole revenue side of this is not where it needs to be. You know, 
Oh, yeah, we're back and forth. Our teams in particular are back and forth, but you also have the we're, – we're, we're talking uh, both privately and publicly, and we have a whole range of options that we're considering, and we have a fair amount of clock left, so to be determined. Yes? You bet. I'm good. I'm good. I'll let them speak for themselves when the event ends. But for myself, tax equity and tax fairness is essential. You know, we inherited a state where the middle class had been somewhere between ignored and ravaged. So it was hollowed out, maybe a, maybe a, a fair, you know, so just two examples, K through 12, cumulative underfunding of the formula by $9 billion. Uh, NJ Transit, the state subsidy at one point was cut by 90 percent. I give you a lot of other data points. So we're now, the great news is this, both with last year's budget, with this year's budget, uh, no matter where it ends up, in all of the days in between, we are all in making the investments in our middle class. And by the way, rekindling the dreams of those in working poor as I was growing up, in folks in poverty who look up someday hoping desperate to get into the middle class. All of that is great. Here's the problem. I can't justify making those same people pay for the very investment in their lives, which is why we need the very wealthiest among us to pay their fair share. I don't begrudge success. It's the American dream. God bless those who have done well. I'm just asking for a re-leveling of the playing field. Under the Christie administration, those folks did really well. They're doing really well in the Trump tax law. Let's get some fairness. And by the way, when the middle class does well, everybody does well, including those 19,000 millionaires. Brett and Michael. We have. That's a, that's a normal course of business. Uh, and we had uh, a cabinet call, I think, on Friday. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll communicate regularly, but that's a normal course of business that we've done. So we did it, I believe, in early June. Michael. It, it is getting better. Uh, so NJ Transit, there's no question the data says it's getting better with a couple of caveats. Uh, it's fine for me to say that, but if it's your train that gets canceled, you're not happy no matter how high our batting average is. And I won't be ha I don't blame you for being upset. And I won't be satisfied until we bat 1,000. So we have to bat 1,000 every time out, and we're not. It's a lot better than it was 18 months ago. Three quick points. When you look at the data, you have to remember we had to achieve the, the federal government's positive train control. Uh, when I inherited the state, we, we were 11 percent of the way there, and the deadline was last December 31st. We made it, but that included enormous dislocations of service. Secondly, uh, we had, again, the Christie administration either had one or zero or furloughed engineering classes on the rail side. This year, we have six. One class has already graduated. But I've been saying all along, we won't see the benefits of that until at least the fall. So you're still going to have higher outages in the summer than other times of the year, just as the, the way the system works. The fact of the matter is we inherited a pool of engineers where the, the, the degrees of freedom have been almost eliminated. That will change. It is changing, but it can't change this overnight. And thirdly, you've got the Amtrak summer work. I wish I could control Amtrak and the Trump administration's funding for the Gateway Tunnel, which would be huge. I wish I could get Governor Christie's decision unwound for the ARC Tunnel. Uh, we're doing our best with our partners that are outside of our immediate control, but we know this summer is going to include dislocations. The long-term trend is a very good one. It won't get there as fast as people want, and if folks are frustrated because their train was late or was canceled, I don't blame them. I'm frustrated too. Please, one more. Uh, 
we haven't closed, I'd say we haven't closed any of the gaps yet. Uh, again, thankful that the budget we got back from the legislature included an overwhelming amount of our priorities, and I can't say that more strongly. Uh, we are not there in terms of our ability to button down their revenues and to, from my, my being able to certify those revenues. Um, we bemoan some of, the, some of the cuts. I mentioned community colleges. In particular, I bemoan the, the lack of tax fairness that I think we need uh, uh, and, and, and deserve, I think, in this state. Um, our offer on the EDA front as a separate matter is, is clear. Uh, we, we have a very explicit suite of five elements that we think will take this state to a different place. And I've been very clear, both in private and public, I will veto categorically uh, any uh, ability to take what is a failed system, even if it were run well, even if this tax, task force never existed. When you finish 42, 47, and 49, uh, you're not a playoff team. Something is not right. You need a new system. Uh, and so this, that, 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 to me, some decisions that I face, in fact, many that I face are complicated, uh, are complex, and take a fair amount of reasoning to get to the right place. Um, whether I accept an a, uh, extension of these economic incentives or not is not one of those. This is a black and white decision. I will veto it, period, full stop. I want to thank the legislators, the electeds generally, NJIT, our extraordinary group of speakers, the murderers row up here with me. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. Uh, keep close. I'm sure we'll be discussing things with you over the course of, the, of, the, of this week. Thank you all.